Jo, äh, Freunde der Teewelten. Silly Huhn mal wieder hier am Start. Äh, ja, let's go. Es ist jetzt der nächste Tag. Nidado ist diesmal leider nicht mit dabei. Wir sind wie immer hier auf Laser Gurkenland mit LP 149.202.137.134, dem äh, freien Vanilla Server ohne Regeln. Wir pumpen heute immer noch Jailbreaking Apple Watch. Diesmal in der dritten Folge. Wir sind schon bei Minute 21 und 26 Sekunden und äh, let's get started. And finally we can resolve okay. objects, we tables, and we get like ja, ich werde ein bisschen versuchen, hier noch ein bisschen so Food zu kriegen und so, damit wir dann bald weiterziehen können. Uh, we set up the primitives, we get the same symbol gauge. Oh keine Knochen. And Seriously. One thing I need is to uh, get the internal kernel structures layout. In this case, it's a proc structure, which represents the process structure in a kernel space. Uh, and the kernels are different between iOS and watch, uh, watchOS, and like I, I cannot even use the XNU source code again because because of the difference. So I start reconstructing oh God, this proc, da hinten, oder? Um, structure just in runtime by um, putting from proc underscore functions. They are referenced to some of the fields in the proc structure, so I can reconstruct. Sorry, see this video not so good. In some really bad cases, I just dump the piece of memory and uh, look for. Okay. Constant values, for example, like CPU type or CPU subtype, the always content on watch has, and I know okay if it's a CPU type, it should be like a field zero extend or so. So I simply reconstruct a few of the structure that I need, and uh, well now it's time to find the patches what to disable in the kernel. That's I use a pretty classic approach called the patch finder. The so I'm looking for a string or byte references. Find. Uh, ah. Uh, yeah, so find a pattern, find a reference to it, and with some additional instruction analysis, we can find the beginning of the function or the variable we need. Ah, it's a skelet. Oh my god, nicht runterfallen. Resolving the syscall table will be pretty knochen. useful here, as we can automatically resolve more than 400 functions. In some bad cases, uh, RM32 instruction emulation was needed to determine it was the sum of the variables allocated. So it was a pretty big win for me. I get a semi gated kernel, I get an internal structures layout, I know what to patch. Now it's time to patch. Um, so I begin my jailbreak work by getting uh, escalated to a root privileges and get out of the sandbox. Yeah, you can also so the most easy mm -hmm. way to do it is to patch the Satry ID function. So there is no kernel patch protection on 32-bit kernels. So nobody really prevents us to, to basically patch a kernel and patch the kernel page tables. So I patch out the checks in Satry ID and just call Satry ID 00 mm -hmm. to, to get the root. Or uh, there is other way if we don't want to patch the uh, kernel code. Uh, it's already heap. Find the pointer to the all uh, proc pointer. In this all proc, find a pointer to the proc structure um, of our process. In this proc structure, find a pointer to ucred structure. And in this ucred, basically update UID, GUID, or UID fields, and basically become a root. The same thing is how to get out of the sandbox. The same ucred structure, just null out the sandbox label. No label, no sandbox restrictions. So we are out of the sandbox. The next thing is uh, how to obtain the kernel task. The kernel task uh, is a pretty useful way to write anywhere in the kernel memory, read anywhere, and even to allocate the kernel memory. So most obvious way to do it is uh, to patch task for bit. It's a special API that return um, the process task to a user mode based on the process ID. Uh, of course, there is a hard-coded check if the process ID is zero, which is kernel, Return now. So we can patch out this check and just read the kernel task. Other way to do it is um, again iterate a heap. Look for an old proc uh, pointer. In this old proc pointer, find the proc structure for a kernel. Um, find a pointer to a task structure in a kernel memory and 
save the send write, which is a self. Uh, just write it to our task uh, bootstrap port. Then in user mode, we can read it by task get special port. It will convert this pointer to useful task structure. Well, yeah, we get a kernel task port. With a kernel task, Leute, it's have my fancy to idea. write anywhere in a kernel memory, including the Can kernel text. Here, so I yeah. start disabling the code sign checks. There is a global variable called debug, which is referenced by all uh, PE item has debugger functions. Who can I then use? Which the debugger capabilities for kernel or one of the drivers. Ah. So we can set it globally to one, or we can patch uh, PE has debugger only for a kernel extension that we need by updating NL symbol pointers. Yeah. The next thing is update was a few variables. Was to this view. Like see support can disable and allow invalid signatures. This will allow us to run any unsigned code on the Apple Watch. And the last thing we need is to remount the root file system. The problem here is that the root file system is uh, mounted as read only, which means if you want to operate with some of the our binaries or just add the new binaries, we need to, to remount it first to be writable. There are a few ways of doing it. Uh, there is a mark mount function in a kernel, and this function is checking if the file system is a root file system, prevent it from remounting. So we can patch out this check and call remount, or again, iterate a heap, find the uh, pointer to root fs v node, and this uh, v node find the pointer to the, mac, uh, the mount flex, and basically remove a check, and then remove the flag which uh, represents that this file system is a root file system. Which means this file system is not a file system, we can easily remount it uh, with a mic mount. Additionally, we need to patch a lightweight volume manager. It's a special kernel um, extension, which is prevent us to write any data to protected uh, partitions. In our case, the root of a pro uh, protected partition, so we need to find map for IO uh, function and patch out is by protected check. In addition, set PE icon has debugger capabilities in this lightweight volume manager. So yeah, basically we, we patch a kernel, we disable most of the restrictions. So now I start to basically uh, compile in my payload. I recompile the drop view, which is lightweight SSH client for this ARM7K architecture, and recompile the basic tools package, like PS, Chmode, LS, and so on. Put everything in my watchOS extension, and basically, as soon as I get out of sandbox, copy it to a root file system. There is a problem here. When, when I spawn the drop view, uh, it got killed. It got killed by sandbox, which means that watchOS has more restrictions than the iOS. So some of the things that just work on iOS get killed by sandbox and watchOS. So I just found the pointers to specific sandbox operations in a kernel and just move them out. OK, now it should work. Uh, but I have a surprise. Here is a list of watchOS interfaces. The AWDL0 looks promising, which is Apple Wi-Fi Direct. But as you see, now it supports only the Bluetooth. Which may be a problem, because I plan to basically connect from my Mac to a watch over the SSH, and I need to somehow to figure out how to uh, run this SSH over the Bluetooth. And there is a way, uh, thanks to for Luca to point me to uh, this possibility. We can use a mobile framework, a mobile device framework on, my, on a Mac and send the special message to a phone. And the fun part that phones should not be jailbroken, it can be any release phone. So we send a message, we'll say, hey, please start forwarding service port with the port 22. And uh, we get a response. We should Companion proxy service port. Man kann nicht wirklich was lesen, oder? Wenn wir das Fullscreen machen, dann klappt das auch nicht besser, oder? Kino? Ah! Jetzt sehen wir die Slides und die Slides sind schwarz. Perfekt! Bisschen abgeschnitten vielleicht. Ja, um, schreibt mal in die so Kommentare, was, <lacht> was hier vielleicht die beste Option wäre. Ich glaube, das macht keinen and Sinn. Und basically, it works. Uh, 
Uh, now I can show you how. Uh, okay. Yes. So, yeah. Könnte so eigentlich mein, I I sollte ich mein Bildschirm drehen und dann beides so im Quermode Hochformat, ne? Which bind port 22 on a watch to a phone and uh, bind the same port from a phone to my Mac. Now I can use that just a local host uh, with this port to connect over the Bluetooth to a watch. Yeah, we get a password prompt and yeah, we got the shell spawned. So let's prove that we are running on the Apple Watch by running the uname, which is Apple Watch uh, on Watch 1.2. Okay. Let's try one of the common line tools like this and down. Hauptsache keiner klatscht, das ist doch der, der Durchbruch hier. The watching is pretty similar for the iOS in the point of security, in the point how the um, operating system work. Oh mein Gott, ich packe das doch nicht, Leute, sorry, uh, aber ihr seht wahrscheinlich genauso wenig. Uh, our drop view client, which is yeah, doing the SSH connection. So, as I said, I recompile the basic tools like tar, like STP to easily archive or unarchive stuff to copy files from a watch. But as for me, pretty painful to copy file from a watch than to a phone and copy it from a phone to a Mac. Uh, so I found more easier way and uh, just STP directly from a Mac to a watch and just upload the files. So in this case, uh, I just take Prod's Explorer binary. It's a tool written by Jonathan Lewin. And yeah, copy it to a watch. We get a pretty good speed over the Bluetooth. Uh, still copying. Yeah, so it's copied. Now let's prove that it's basically only watch by running our Cross Explorer. As I said, it's a tool that's like similar to PS or Top, but it shows the memory pressure and some other useful things. So the process called the watch pawn is our jailbreak. So yeah, basically the copying to watch pro. Now we need to find a way how to easily copy files from a watch to a Mac. For this purpose, I use like SSH to watch. Okay, I the uh, uh, archive some of the files that I need, uh, and use a pipe to easily just dump everything to my my. Oh, and skelet. Let's check how it works. So yeah, it starts archiving the private frameworks on a Apple Watch, and that's I switched to my Mac, basically to prove that we got some files copied. Yeah, it's like three yeah. megabytes of Apple Watch data was just copied to my Mac with that one single comment. Okay, this is basically the SSH on the watch. Uh, so I start looking, okay, we, we get a jailbreak on the watch and the watch have access to SMS, calls, even the photos and emails can be synced it to, uh, to a watch. It can fetch a GPS location from a phone. It, in some cases, if you use a watch to answer a call, it has a microphone usage and even it's enrolled in an Apple Pay. So it may be pretty interesting to, to look what, what is on a uh, system. So as I said, we have jailbreak, so it's full access to file system and we can look for uh, escalate databases, not limited to the messages, the call history, contacts, emails, and so on. So what's going to be next? Um, I basically recompiled the hooking engine that can do an interposing on trampoline to hook some of the system function, which means that I can cache data when the data will be synced between iPhone and a watch. So maybe in the future we will see a, the tweaks for, for a watch, or as I said, we can run the Frida or Radar and on this pretty small watch script. Okay, um, so as we see, the watch has is a, it's a pretty secure operating system. Its security is equal to iOS, but still there are some differences and uh, some of the techniques that we use on iOS should be adapted for the watch. And as for me, uh, the data forensic may be a little bit easier on the watch. 
based on the phone, because phone have all the internal based protectors and like the hardware restriction, which watch doesn't have. Okay, um, basically we still have time for questions. Yeah, it was an Apple Web jailbreak. Ich habe ungefähr nichts mitgenommen aus diesem Talk. Seriously. Okay, let's go. Um, pumpen wir noch irgendeinen iOS-Talk, oder? Um, uh, das sieht crappy aus. Government surveillance software. So I want to start with. Uh, yeah, uh, here uh, uh, learning about government software surveillance software. software. I want to start with a sort of general presumption, uh, which is that. Here from Def Con 25 from Peyton Engel. I don't know. Now, I'll start with the example of breath analyzers uh, back in the mid 2000s. Cops would be pulling people over, making them blow in a tube, and using that to make a decision as to whether or not to make an arrest. And people thought, well, what if there are problems with the breath analyzer? How, why should we trust it? Why, what's the really probable cause for an arrest here? And indeed, eventually some enterprising people got their hands on the so source code for intoxilizer and found out that it did have some real problems and, and might yield some false positive results. And anyone who remembers the 80s will remember the clipper chip uh, en endeavor when the government just said, hey, I know what we'll do. We'll hold on to the one true key for all encryption. And you guys can have your own keys, but we'll be able to just kind of backdoor that. And this is a, a, an idea with a, a, just a built-in fundamental flaw. Uh, should be pretty obvious to everyone here. But anytime you hear, just kind of trust us, we know what we're doing, that's what gets, gets me riled up. And so what I'm going to talk about is a series of tools that are, are, were developed for, for surveilling peer-to-peer um, -peer networks. And they are not made public. And the government just says, just trust us, we know what we're doing. And, and because they're not public, I haven't seen them. I don't know anyone who has seen them, unless they are a sworn agent, and they won't talk to me about it. Uh, and so the inferences that I'm going to show you here are made from just reading dozens and dozens of search warrant affidavits when they describe how the thing works and what it does. And so we can make some deductions about what it actually, what it actually does. And that's where we're headed. Um, so surveillance is fairly pervasive these days. Uh, there's a law that says you probably shouldn't install an untappable phone system. Um, what? We've got uh, the NSA metadata call collection, or call metadata collection stuff, where they, we realize that content uh, analysis is fun, but traffic analysis can be just as fun. Uh, and, and surveillance is also pretty secret. We usually don't find out about it until there's a leak and everyone gets in the press and heads roll. And there's more than just surveillance going on. Surveillance, by surveillance, I mean just passive collection of information. But we see now some more invasive uh, efforts as well. And there's a, a series of cases right now, the Playpen series of cases, which some people in the room I'm sure are familiar with, where the government embedded uh, some malware that opened a side channel. People would browse to a website using Tor. The government operated that website for a while and planted some, some malware that opened a side channel and would leak the, the user's public IP address back, back to the government. So uh, that's not just surveillance. That's actually changing things. And, and you might need a warrant for that. And some, some cases are getting tossed for that reason, but by far not all. And we know that the government is collecting exploits. That's not been a secret at all. So one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves is where is the boundary between just a good old fashioned aggressive investigation of crime and violating people's rights and sort of taking things one step too far. So that's the prologue. Let's get down to it. Um, when I talk about peer-to-peer -peer networks, I mean things like BitTorrent, Nutella, Aries, or eDonkey, or whatever they call it. Um, these have been around for a long time. Uh, the Nutella variant of the tool that I'm talking about was in use at least as early as 2009. I don't know if anyone really uses Nutella anymore. I'm sure the tool still exists. Um, and these are generally, the tools that I'm talking about are generally forks of open source software. So there's been a, a, a tool developed, you know, like MicroTorrents or whatever, or um, Fex, that's one of the ones. And some enterprising software developers. BitTorrent is closed source? Das wusste ich gar nicht. Some extra stuff. So they, they make I can't use the peer-to-peer protocol 
that are normally obscured from the user. They're, they're below what the user sees. And they add in some features that would not really be of interest to ordinary users, and we'll talk about what those are. So who develops these? Well, one guy, the, the, the tool for the Aries network was developed by this one person, Joseph Versace. He's a, he's a Canadian law enforcement uh, programmer and analyst. There's a, there's a collaboration between the CS departments at a couple of universities and some police departments that produced uh, Roundup, which is kind of the most best known of these tools. Um, and it's based on the, the effects of uh, Nutella plan. And there's a, a, a version of it for BitTorrent as well. So they're developed by, you know, normal folks, academics, and so forth. And they make new uses of some existing features. So for Nutella, when you do a search, when you get a query hit, it comes back and it includes the SHA-1 hash value of the files that the search hits are. So this is a nice, quick, easy way to identify if you happen to have a database of files that you knew nobody should possess. Uh, you could just quit, see, do these hash values match, and then you instantly have good targets for investigation. Um, and Nutella also has a feature called swarming, where if, if I admit that I'm sharing a file, I will also try to tell you about all the other people I know about who are sharing that file, so that you can grab it from multiple peers, and it doesn't all have to come from me. And then you can directly uh, browse peers as well, not just do searches, but once you've found someone who's in your telephone, you can just go and query them and, and get a list of uh, what files they have, regardless of whether your search turned up those files or not. So that's those are, you know, kind of interesting features if you were an investigator, it's kind of fun. Um, on BitTorrent, we have a couple other things that are what are called tracker messages, and this tells which peers are interested in which torrents. So if somebody is looking for something, you might be able to detect them on that basis. Um, and when they connect for downloads or when they acquire new segments, uh, um, clients will send out some announcements of what segments they've got so that they can immediately begin participating in the sharing. Remember, the whole idea of BitTorrent was that bandwidth is asymmetrical. We can upload, we can download things way faster than we can upload them, generally speaking. And so we want to share large files. What we'll do is everybody shares segments of the files, or can we share the whole file, but we'll grab segment, a segment from here, and a segment from there, and a segment from here. And that means we can download multiple things while we're only uploading, you know, whatever our up upstream bandwidth is. Uh, and then there's something called pure exchange, which is kind of like the, the swarming feature for Nutella. So this is, these are the features that it exploits on, on BitTorrent. And then we add in some features as well. Um, known file lists, so a database of known files of interest, so that we can quickly determine when we see search query results whether they are things that we want to be investigating. Uh, IP geolocation, are these doofuses in our jurisdiction? So before we spend a whole lot of time investigating something, can we at least tell if we would have the power of arrest over these people? Uh, single source downloading, this is, uh, we don't want to find out, we don't want to swear out a warrant and go and rouse someone out of bed and seize their computer, only to find out that they only had the first three segments of an 80 segment torrent, uh, we want to know that they have the whole thing, and so that means we have to download the whole file from them. So this is completely antithetical to what BitTorrent is designed to do. Uh, we're going to, instead of grabbing things from all over the place, we're going to grab them from just one thing. And that's, that's a, it's not really a subversion of the protocol, but it's a, a use other than what it was designed for. And then fake file sharing also. Uh, we'll get throttled if we're not sharing anything. Uh, and if we share the right kinds of things, we might attract people into connecting to us. Am I doing something funny with the micros? Okay, I'm okay? All right. <laughs> um, so we, 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 we don't want to actually be distributing contraband, so we're not going to actually do that. But we're going to announce that we have it to share, to see who will connect to us, and also so that we don't get throttled. Uh, so it looks like we're sharing and we don't get um, taken out of, the, out of the network. Finally, we'll have